Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Warren Brown. He is director of the Lee Edwards Travis Research Institute and professor of psychology in the Department of Doctoral Psychology at Fuller Theological Seminary. Currently, he is most actively involved in neuroscience research in two main areas, the cognitive and psychological disabilities in a congenital brain malformation called a genesis of the corpus callosum, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today, and also the consequences in adults of a childhood hemispheric a misferectomy for the control of seizures. Dr. Brown has authored or co-authored over 75 scholarly articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals such as Neuropsychologia, Psychophysiology, Biological Psychiatry, Developmental Neuropsychology, Cortex, Nature Review, Neuroscience and Science. 15 chapters in edited scholarly books and over 150 presentations at scientific meetings. So, Dr. Brown, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you for inviting me. I look forward to talking with you. Okay, great. So, today we're going to talk about different questions, theoretical questions, mostly regarding how we look at the relationship between the mind and the brain, the brain and the body, the mind and the body, and also how we get to the mind. I mean, if it's if it's more of an emergentistic approach that we should have, or a reductionistic one, or, I mean, a, uh, another one. Uh, but my first question is, um, I mean, in our East, in the history of Western thinking, and when it comes to these relationships that I've been talking about, uh, Cartesianism pops to mind and mind-brain mm -hmm. dualism. So. Today, with what we know and the knowledge that Descartes didn't have back then, uh, is there any version of mind-brain dualism that still makes sense? Well, it's uh, to some degree a vocabulary and definitional problem. That is, the classical um, mind-body Cartesian uh, point of view, the mind is a non-material thing, uh, but it's a thing, a substance of some kind. And if you are a non-dualist like I am and uh, understand our mind as an emergent property, a functional emergent property of us functioning as whole brains and bodies, uh, then the question is do you consider an emergent property a thing? Mm -hmm. And if you consider the emergent property a thing, then there's a version of dualism, somebody called, people call it emergent dualism, that perhaps makes some sense. I don't prefer that way of thinking about properties because it confuses. We generally think of things as having physical substance and an emergent property is the way of functioning of a merger of a thing, but it's so to differentiate or to pull it apart from the the from its embodiment is not a way I prefer to think about our minds and our bodies. Mm -hmm. so. Right, and we're going to talk that uh, in a few minutes, but. Uh, let, let, let me ask you another question. It seems to me, I mean, uh, I might be wrong, and if I am, please correct me, but nowadays it seems that uh, the position that is held by lots and lots of neuroscientists, neurobiologists, and so on, is that the correct approach to thinking about the relationship between the mind and the brain is a reductionistic one. That is, we would explain how the mind operates, reducing it to the operations that we see at the level of neurons, uh, synapses, and things like that. So, uh, what is the problem with that approach? Well, one of the problems is as soon as you do neurobiological reductionism and say that you're looking at the, looking at the prefrontal cortex in some 
human behavior. As soon as you're looking at the prefrontal cortex, the behavior you wish to describe as now sort of disappeared, that you have a correlate between that thing happening in the prefrontal cortex and the behavior of the person. But the behavior and thoughts of the person is still a more, an emergent holistic property that is non-reducible to the prefrontal cortex, even though the prefrontal cortex is an important part of that emergent property. And if the prefrontal cortex were damaged, the property that emerges would be different, but it would still be an emergent property that's not reduce, entirely reducible to the activity of the prefrontal cortex. You, you lose your whole person as soon as you do a reductive, even though, I mean, I'm a neuroscientist, I look at the corpus callosum, there are some properties of people with a genesis of the corpus callosum that I think are not reducible to, but are contributed to by the absence of the corpus callosum. So if they had a corpus callosum, this property would not emerge differently. So the corpus callosum is important, but it's not the thing in itself. It's important to contributing to the mental or psychological or, or personality uh, property. Mm -hmm. So let me see if I get this right uh, from what you just said. So even if we have different areas of the brain that perform different functions, and if one of them is damaged, then the function that is usually performed by it is lost, or at least uh, partially or totally lost. Uh, I mean, it, it still doesn't mean that we can reduce what uh, the mind is to the operations that are performed on that particular area, is that it? Yeah, and, and, and one obvious um, support of that view is that the prefrontal cortex or the corpus callosum don't operate by themselves. They are important nodes in huge networks that include the whole nervous system and the body. So if that little node doesn't operate well, it changes the nature of the whole network. But the property of the person that you're trying to describe is still a property emergent from the function of the whole system, even though it doesn't emerge the same way because some area of that vast network is not functioning or not functioning well. Mm -hmm. So in the emergentistic approach that you, you have, is it true that the whole is more than the sum of its parts, or and if so, in what ways? Well, in the sense that um, the whole is, um, which is our personhood, um, is emergent from the interactivity of these parts, and it, all of the parts have to be there for it to emerge in a particular way. If some part is, is damaged or operating different, the operation of the whole emerges in a somewhat different way, but it's still the property is a property of the whole that gets affected by certain changes in uh, the parts. So it's, yeah, somewhat more than the sum of its parts for sure, I think. And that the interactivity creates something that's not reducible to that particular part. Mm -hmm. And so is, uh, if the mind is an emergent property of the brain, let's say, how should we look at the relationship between them? I mean, how do we get, for example, from a neuronal functioning to a mind? Um, well, they, they interact in complex ways. So the, the whole theory of dynamical systems comes out of the whole theory that um, complex and uh, complex systems that are highly interactive and are reciprocally interactive uh, and emerge properties that each of the parts contributes to, but the, the uh, whole, the, the mind, is more than just, is um, 
is a de is a descriptor that has to be a descriptor of the functionality of the whole thing, not some particular part. So, uh, in describing dynamical systems, I often talk about and me and other people talk about ant colonies. It's a nice, nice uh, metaphor, or it's more than a metaphor. An ant colony is a dynamical system, and I always t tell my students this little story. So, if I had a a bucket full of 10,000 ants, and I went and I dumped them out on the dirt uh, by my house, uh, they would be running around, and they would, would be an aggregate. There would be a lot of ants there, and to some degree, they would be interactive, but they would not form a system that has any emergent properties beyond the properties of individual ants running around. If that 10,000 ants survived a week later, I came back, they would have survived because they would have self-organized themselves into a colony that had certain descriptive properties of things that are emergent from the colony, like foraging and building a nest and lots of things like that. So now you have a system that is the colony that has properties that affect the world in ways that are not descriptors of the individual ants running around on the dirt. So, um, yeah, that's how I think about it. So I think our, 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 our mind, our personalities, our selfhood, our emergent properties of a whole lot of neural things that interact in ways that allow these properties to emerge. Mm -hmm. But do you think that if we were able to describe all of the complex interactions that occur between neurons, for example, and between molecules that are part of neurons and synapses and things like that. I mean, to, if we had a complete map of what's happening in the brain when it performs a certain function, do you think that we could reduce the mind to that? No, we would say that the mind is embodied, but that very map is a, is a description of the merger properties. So it's a hugely incomprehensibly complex map. And the functionality is in the map, what the map describes, not in the parts of the map. So even there, you have a emergent descriptor that's more complex than the parts that contribute to the, the map. So all you're, all you're saying is if we can describe everything, that means we're embodied, which I absolutely believe, but we're embodied in a way that, that our functionality at the high, highest level really are, at just about any level you look, is an emergent property of the things that are happening inside of it. Mm -hmm. So like the, the amygdala and the nucleus and the um, temporal lobe that has a lot to do with our emotionality. There are all kinds of things happening in the amygdala. So the, there's emergent properties of the amygdala that contribute to the emergent properties of us. But even those properties of the amygdala are not entirely reducible to the functionality of the cells in the amygdala because the cells don't themselves don't have that property. The amygdala has that property. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I understand. So you mentioned embodiment. Do you agree with the embodied cognition approach that some people have nowadays? I mean, because we've been talking about the relationship between the mind and the brain, but there's also a relationship between the brain and the body. Right? Yes. I, yeah, I totally, I've written a lot on this. I believe in embodied cognition, I think. Uh, and, I, and embodied cognition is most um, relevant to thinking about the mind when you um, uh, bring in simulation theory. Mm -hmm. That is our thinking is a simulation of bodily action and bodily interaction with the world. So uh, for example, most of your sort of, of um, reminiscing or, or um, um, thinking about something sitting in your chair is a lot of it's simulated speech. If you really think about what's going on in your head, you're talking to yourself or talking to someone, or it's simulated bodily interaction with the world. So if I'm thinking about, you know, an event, having played a game or something, I actually think about it with simulations of 
my bodily remembers of doing something in the world. So in that sense, our cognitions are built on and are part of our bodily interaction with the world, start with. Secondly, they're the whole um, object of mind is sort of, what do I do next? And that may be what do I need to think about next or where does this thought lead? But it's all uh, nested in um, sensory motor feedbacks, either real sensory motor feedbacks or uh, simulated ones. And you see that a lot in experiments where if somebody's thinking about things, you can detect certain bodily things going on that are sub-threshold. You don't notice them, but, and it also uh, occurs to me that when I talk, I can't help but gesture because the, all the things going on in my head are, are bodily things that come out in gestures. I often, um, I'm now with uh, teaching online, I'm having to lecture, basically recording a lecture for students to watch later. And although there's a little uh, kind of small round image of my face uh, on the screen with my PowerPoint, uh, the students cannot see me gesture. But in talking about this stuff, I just find myself gesturing because there's something very embodied about the con our mental processes. They basically are based on originally embodied in action with interaction with the world, and therefore we're able to use that in a simulated way to think uh, theoretically or hypothetically uh, about properties in the world. Mm -hmm. So the way we think is also influenced by the way our body is structured. Yeah, so I often, when I lecture, give this little um, story about uh, if I were an elephant, that is, I had a body of an elephant, but I had the brain of a human being, mm -hmm. I would have a very different mind. So the mind isn't totally constructed on the nature of the brain, it's the nature of the brain's the interaction with the body and, and the way the brain sort of records and, and, and controls and interacts with the world through the body. So if I'm interacting with the world through a elephant's body, I began over my lifetime to construct a very different kind of mind than if I'm interacting with the world through a human body. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, the mind would be different in, if we were to put a human's brain inside a, an elephant's body? Yeah. But, uh, but, I mean, in what ways exactly? Uh, I mean, would, would, it, uh, would it mean that uh, there, were, there would be certain cognitive mechanisms that wouldn't be present there, that we have with our brains placed in our human bodies, or what exactly? They, they are mental life and our mind, our intellect, whatever is built up from infancy through adulthood as we interact physically with the world. So an infant is interacting with the world and le learns some new things and it interacts w with more of the world and then just builds up this uh, huge uh, understanding of the world that is their cognitive systems and intelligence. If you are interacting with the world as through an elephant's body, you have a different way. For example, you manipulate things with a trunk, not with hands with five fingers and a thumb, so that and you don't have an opposable thumb. You maybe have an opposable part of the trunk, I don't know. But that, that represents a sensory uh, motor-wise very different um, interactions with the same objects. So you, you could appreciate the same objects, but you appreciate them differently if you're an elephant than if you're in a human body. So uh, that's, it's just kind of metaphoric, but it, uh, but it illustrates the fact that our minds are the accumulation of our embodied interaction with the world. And if those bodies are somewhat different, that is going to influence to some degree the nature of the mind, what can be thought about, how it can be thought about. You know. mm -hmm.
very interesting. And in thinking about these relationships between the mind and the brain, for example, I mean, there's another question that is important for us to address here, that is the one of causation. So where uh, uh, is it the case that the arrow of causation points in a single direction, or is it both ways? I mean, because I was just thinking that when we talked about the whole and the parts, I mean, is it the case that the arrow of causation points from the parts to the whole or also the other way around? How does it work exactly? Well, the ultimate uh, cause or the ultimate that we want to explain is the agency of the organism, the agency of the human being. And that has two causes. One is those sort of highest level emergent property causes where the system is operating entirely together so uh, when we talked about the ant colony, the ant colony, once it operates as a system, is a cause in the world as a system that you can't reduce to the parts. At the same time, you know, it's obvious from neurology, from neuropharmacology, that you can tamper with the parts and have some impact on what emerges in the whole. So the causation definitely goes both ways. And so all of neuroscience and neuropsychology that I participate in most directly and, and um, uh, other areas of biological science always have causations going both ways. That is the thing operating as a whole has a cause and then there are things that happen in the, in the, within the system that can change the nature of the causes that emerge. So those are kind of bottom-up influences, and then we have, but it depends on causing what. So if you're talking about the cause of me as an agent of the world, I think that is in fact a holistic property, and that's mostly top-down or whole part. I, that is me as a whole influences what goes on in, in all of the parts in a kind of interactive way. But it's interactive, you can't, the problem is you have a very uh, extremely tightly integrated system going on and it's very difficult to act as though you can take a part out and talk about the causality of this part by itself in some way. That just, that just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And are there emergent properties of the mind that uh, also uh, I mean, that also cause or have uh, a power of causality over things that happen below. I mean, for example, is it the case that consciousness might also uh, cause certain things that happen in the brain or in particular areas, for example? Well, that if, you, if you're a dualist with respect to consciousness, I guess that's what you would say. But I, I'm not, I think consciousness is somehow an integral part. The explanation of that uh, people argue about a lot, but I think the consciousness is our sort of immediate current um, experience of ourselves functioning as a whole being and functioning as a whole being in relationship to what's in the environment. So you can't take this and extract it from its immediate interactions with the environment. And so the causality for me as a whole is how am I going inter to interact with the environment now? And so that's me as a whole. That gets influenced. What can emerge in my agentive interaction with the world might be affected by some things going on, let's say, abnormally in my brain, let's say, due to a pharmacological agent. So if I took LSD, then what the way I interact with the world is obviously going to change and we can express that as a bottom-up influence on what emerges from me as possibilities of my interaction with the world. It changes what I sense, my sensory world, and it probably changes my motor, or motor systems work and all of that works together. That means me as a whole being, as an agent, interacts differently with the world than if I would if I didn't take LSD. But nevertheless, there's all kinds of my history built into that. 
So it's not like something comes to mind that's totally outside of anything I've experienced in the world. It just gets all mixed up in a different way and expresses itself in me as a whole in a different way when I've taken LSD than when I haven't or when I've taken um, um, dopamine drug, an SSRI or something. So th these things definitely interact. You can't. So when we talked about the arrow going both ways, I d definitely think the arrow goes both ways. But I wouldn't take. I don't. I don't take consciousness and set it off as something that's immaterial. I think the explanation is difficult. I think philosophers' statements about consciousness and subjective experience has actually made the problem harder rather than clarifying the problem. And I think if we get rid of some of the philosophical arguments and deal with the neurobiological arguments, we actually could think better about consciousness than just calling it the hard problem and dismissing it. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned the philosophers because, uh, I mean, I'm not sure if this is because it's more intuitive for us or if it's because we are influenced by the work of philosophers and other people, but when we think about the mind, it's very easy for us to separate it from the brain or even when we think about consciousness to, to try to place it in a particular... I mean, when we think about it, that, that it's in a particular place and the brain is in another place and then, uh, I mean, when we think about, okay, so what causes the behavior? Is it our conscious thoughts or something that happens unconsciously and we tend to have some sort of layer of separation there between the two things? Well, I think this gets really... Uh, impossible to talk about from my point of view because of the way we use language. We talk about the mind and we talk about consciousness as a noun property where I think mind is a verb. We mind, we don't have a mind. And if you clean up your language that way, from my point of view, uh, then this doesn't get philosophically so um, I know, problematic, at least problematic for me. And so consciousness, I think, is we are conscious. We don't have a consciousness. Mm -hmm. And and so I think that's, for me, that's the big problem. I, I, and it's what makes it very difficult to talk about consciousness when you want to make it a noun rather than a verb, let's say, or a descriptive adjective. or. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about an illustrative example of several of the many things that we've been touching on here. That is the genesis of the corpus callosum. You've done work on that. So what is it about? And uh, I mean, how does it illustrate some of these relationships that we've been talking about here? So just to explain the situation, Persons with agenesis of the corpus callosum have been born, that is, it's a congenital disorder, without the corpus callosum, which is 200 million neurons that interconnect the right cerebral hemisphere and the left cerebral hemisphere. And in many of these cases, the cases we study, the cerebral hemispheres are normal or substantially normal. And so you have two normally functioning cerebral hemispheres that are not interconnected robustly. There's an anterior commissure that's usually there, so that's 50,000 fibers versus missing 200 million fibers that interconnect the two. So it's sort of like uh, having two computers operating side by side that have a certain emergent calculation capacity, but that if you link them with a, a bus that is a really heavy, robust bus, what emerges in the capacity to compute is much greater than the sum of the two computers independently. Larger problems can be tackled. They can be tackled quick, more quickly. Uh, you can, can uh, shift certain parts of the problem to one hemisphere and the other hemisphere. So that's sort of a, a metaphor. And so I think um, what we have found in agenesis of the corpus callosum is not absence of emergence, but weakness in the emergence of some mental properties. And the most remarkable of which is 
things like novel problem solving, creativity, imagination. Uh, these, they, they have some creativity, they have some imagination, um, they have some ability to solve problems, but not just a, not as robustly as persons with the same general intelligence level, but that have a corpus callosum. So that's what we've been studying. I think it, it lends itself to thinking about the nature of emergence, that emergence occurs by rich interactivity mm -hmm. of the parts, two-way interactivity and emergence. If you reduce interactivity of the cerebral hemispheres by 200 million neurons, some things just don't emerge robustly. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, uh, they are um, they are weak in understanding highly nuanced, sophisticated humor. Mm -hmm. So they don't they just kind of don't get it. And the sort of lower level of humor that's a little more on the slapstick or they get they get it's not like they don't have a sense of humor or don't have an idea that some things can be funny, but some things that are funny because of of subtle shifts in language use, for example, in the in the joke, they they just don't quite get it often. Not now this varies, but by and large. So I, I think a genesis of the corpus callosum for me as a model for a, a weakness of emergent of agentive personal properties in a person because of reduced interconnectivity. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. I was just thinking, uh, is it the case that uh, people which suffer from this condition, I mean, are they good models to study things like lateralization of certain functions because since they don't have the two hemispheres connected with one another i mean i was just this just came to my mind i mean the, yeah. does that make sense yeah. yeah and that that's one of the first problems and so far it looks like uh, lateralization is at least at the base level uh, the same as a person with a corpus callosum so my colleague dr lynn paul at caltech is doing some fmri studies on fundamental mental processing like language and visual spatial and whatever and so far it appears to be uh, fairly uh, normally lateralized no. mm -hmm. yeah okay so uh, we've already <coughs> talked about uh, consciousness and you touched a little bit on agency what about the question of determinism and things related to free will and moral responsibility i mean because the, the uh, i mean we can talk about each of these things separately but all of these questions emerge right yeah. particularly the one of determinism is very relevant here because when we look at things from a scientific perspective it seems to be the only possible option yeah well i think the first thing is what we don't want is complete indeterminism we want to ha have understand people as having certain personality and trustworthy characteristics of them as a person that we can count on. And so we don't want each other to be totally indeterministic. We want, and same way, we don't want total free will. So I, I, it's not reasonable for me to even want to have the free will to do things that are totally outside of my life experience. The only way I can interact with the world as I encounter it moment by moment is out of my vast repertoire of interactive experiences of dealing with the world and myself as a, as a dynamical system organizing in a way to face that issue and face that issue and face that issue. But over time, we, we uh, develop huge repertoires of possibilities and so we, our free will, as it is, uh, that we um, have to exercise is basically an arbitration of the possibilities that, that generate themselves given this current circumstance. So I'm in some circumstance that puts a pressure on me to decide to do some things and, you know, 10 things come to mind. And what my agency is to choose among those 10 things in some ways. And you can demonstrate uh, 
the neurobiological processes of that choice going on even in a rat that's learned to, to differentiate between response A and response B to stimulus A and stimulus B. And if you sort of fudge those stimuli so there's, it's ambiguous, you can, can see the rat, rat's nervous system beginning to arbitrate whether to do A or B, given what the current circumstance is. That's a very low level description. Um, Bill Newsom at Stanford has done a lot of work on this really interesting kind of stuff, but it, it suggests to me that what we have in our agency, and we're way more complex than a rat, and we have a whole lot of things we understand that's more complex than a rat, and uh, so we, we have our ability to understand the world in certain complex ways and therefore arbitrate our decision making between these things. Um, come back to agenesis of the corpus callosum. We certainly know that persons with agenesis of the corpus callosum in uh, um, social situations generate less imagination about possibilities. For example, their theory of mind, they don't have a theory of mind in a way, but it's not all that robust. So they don't quite know what your, is going on with you. And so they their choice pattern and their arbitration pattern is different than somebody who actually gets all of that. And so I think we're, what we're doing is not just being totally indeterminate. And what we're not doing is being totally free to do anything in the world. But what we're arbitrating between is the best and the not so best of the possible responses to this situation, given where I am right now. And that has a lot to do with the accumulation of self-organizing response properties with respect to situations in the world. So uh, uh, um, Damasio and Descartes' error made a lot of the fact that when we are doing that arbitrating, mm -hmm. a lot of that we're doing is we're kind of simulating maybe doing this, and then we get a res an autonomic response from our body that is kind of like, ooh, you don't want to do that. And so we decide, well, maybe I'll do this, and you get a response back from your bo body that says, you know, that's probably, in terms of you as a whole being, that's probably a better response. So I often think about, you're in a conversation, with some other people and you think of saying something and you kind of get this feeling like, oh, I shouldn't say that. That's not the right thing to say. I'll say this. And it's basically a bodily feeling. We just kind of feel uncomfortable with saying that right now. I don't know why I don't want to say that. And that's not deterministic. I, sometimes I go ahead and say it, you know, and then see how that turns out. But it is influences on the way myself as a whole being arbitrates possibilities for behavior at any particular instant in time, given the circumstances I'm in and given my history. Mm -hmm. So would it be correct to say that there are different degrees of free will and that those depend on how our brain is organized? Because since you mentioned, for example, the fact that we, are, we have a brain that is more complex than the one of a rat, and no. you also mentioned the example of people who suffer from a genesis of the no. corpus callosum and their reduced agency in a way. I mean, no. is it correct to talk about different degrees of free will? Yeah, I mean, this is in some sense obvious when we think about human life developmentally. So an infant has very few degrees of freedom. It does not have free will in the broadest sense at all. And as the infant develops more and more interactions with the world and self-organizes more and more possible response patterns, it de begins to develop a freedom that it can, there's more things that it can do in this situation, more things to choose from. And then at the other end of the spectrum, as old people like me begin to get Alzheimer's disease are, or just senility of whatever kind, our degrees of freedom begin to be narrow because some things just don't come to mind because our nervous system is not functioning the same way it did when we were 40, let's say. Uh, and then obviously the effects of uh, neurological disease or neuropharmacological interventions, both good and bad, are things that influence the degrees of our 
capacities. And then we talk about, I, uh, in the agenesis of the corpus callosum world, I'm very much involved with a large number of families with a family member with agenesis. And the ones that are, my lab studies are the higher functioning ones that have an I, IQ in the normal range. But I w go, go to the uh, meetings of the National Organization of Disorders of the Corpus Callosum, which is families with ch children or family members across the whole cognitive range. And, you know, you, you realize that, that you have to think about the implications of this with people with congenital problems, which their body and brain don't function the same way that a normally functioning individual functions. And so, you know, how do you think about that? I think there is some infringement on their free will in the sense that there's not as many possibilities for them that they can even bring to mind. And uh, therefore their range is restricted. And uh, yeah, which I would like to add one thing to that though. Uh, I wrote a chapter in um, a book uh, that I helped edit called um, Whatever Happened to the Soul. And I was writing a chapter on the uh, soulish, the cognitive and, and psychosocial properties that contribute to our understanding of human beings as soulish beings. And these are basically relational properties. So I wrote this whole chapter and I got to the end and I thought, oh my gosh, what about people with agenesis or autism or whatever who have lesser relational possibilities and therefore have restricted in my definition there up to that point, soulishness, uh, is this problematic? Of course it's problematic. And then I began to think about that more and if relationality is the sort of primary dimension through which one understands the kind of soulish properties of human beings, then that, that property is almost never symmetric between two people. Most, most of the time, or a lot of the time, it's asymmetric. So you can think about an infant and the mother, the relationality of the infant and the mother is asymmetric the mother maintains more of that relationality on behalf of the infant uh, in order for the infant to stay engaged relationally. And so the people in this with uh, uh, reduced physical and, and cognitive properties from congenital issues that are there at our meetings are being asymmetrically undergirded by their families in a ways that allows them to be ritually human and soulish, not totally based on their own capacities. So I think we almost always or have points in our life and times in our life and times in the days or whatever, which our relationality is being supported more by the under per other person than it is by me. And then there are times that I support relationality in a person beyond what they can manage. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, still talking about free will. I, I yeah. mean, we, I mean, when we think about free will, we think about uh, us having to make decisions and putting in place the several options and then picking one. Yeah. Uh, but I, I mean, uh, but do we have control over what uh, of the options we think about? Because I was just thinking that even if it's not genetic, I mean, even if it's learned, the options that pop into our minds, I mean, do, do we have any sort of control over that? Um, the whole mindfulness literature suggests that maybe we do if we um, be a little bit more mindful about where we are and what we're doing. Mm -hmm. But we don't escape our histories and so we are responsible for our histories uh, even though some of, a lot of that history we didn't create ourselves, we were part of that and so that, so I may not have uh, freedom to think about to 
I take option X, the A, B, C, and D are the only options that come to my mind. And maybe the best option is option X, but I've never experienced option X. That is not in my repertoire. That's therefore, I don't have the freedom to do X unless somebody says to me, how about X? Mm-hmm. And in which case I might say, oh yeah, I hadn't thought of that. That didn't come to mind. And so we are, we can't, as human beings, we can't escape uh, the, in some sense, responsibility for ourselves as historical beings. And so we always have to do the best we can out of our historical life. So one of the things that we know about life, for example, of poverty, Mm -hmm. is that it may constrict or the range of possibilities a person has at a moment in time, and they just don't think of X because X has never been, you know, in their life they have experienced. And so A, B, and C are the only choices they have. So uh, I just, it's somewhat, yeah, I just think we, we got to, take credit ourselves or be realistic about ourselves that, uh, you know, the the things that are going to come to my mind are probably out of my history. If I'm going to do anything else, I need other people to teach me and help me to relearn. Maybe I need to be more mindful with respect to uh, letting things come to mind that wouldn't otherwise if I just responded. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's change topics now and talk a little bit about religion and meaning, because those are another couple of very complex issues, yeah. I think, and uh, with different dimensions and layers to them. So, I mean, how do you, what is the best way for us to think about religious experiences and the relationship that they have? with the brain. I mean, uh, because there are people like, for example, I think it was Ramachandran that at a certain point proposed a God module or a God spot in the brain. But is that the best way to think about it? No, my first complaint with this whole thing is to reduce religiousness to religious experiences. Hmm. And most people, when they're talking about religious experiences, are talking about experiences that are not normative in most religions. Mm -hmm. That you can be religious in that way and never have that kind of experience. So that's odd to me to start with. I'm a religious person. I look myself at other people that I'm around and said those kind of experiences are not normative. Sometimes they have them and sometimes they don't. And some people don't never have that kind of experience and are very religious. And so first of all, I think that's an incredible reductionism to reduce religiousness to subjective experiences. Second thing is the subjective experiences that Ramachandran is talking about are basically sort of emotive kinds of experiences and the God spot he talks about is some area in the amygdala and it is a area that's mostly dealing with the general significance of things and I don't think it's a a area of the brain that's uniquely wired for religiousness at all. It's wired or participates in our understanding of significance of events as a whole. And if that significance happens given our our history and other things we understand to be explicable better religiously, that experience of significance is better explained religiously than as it explained uh, some other way than uh, that experience gets a a different kind of an overlay. But I think that what is happening in the amygdala that Ramachandran talk about is just uh, not unique to religiousness. It happens all the time in all kinds of human interactions where we get the experience of something being very significant, but then our interpretive matrix for that may be be religious or may not be religious. So I, I don't believe in God spots. I don't believe there's a unique uh, neural structure or that is um, particular to religiousness. Uh, you might talk about certain kinds of whole cortical brain networks 
that function a particular way in a person and that for them is religious and a, and but that way of functioning may not be the same way as another person who is uh, religious and functioning at the moment in a way they would call religious, their brain may be actually functioning in a whole pattern that's different than somebody else. So, Yeah. So do you think that the kinds of behaviors and, uh, I mean, mental activity that people uh, study in, for example, experimental psychology or in no. anthropology. I mean, do you think that many of those are not representative of the experiences that uh, common religious people have when they think about God or they no. think about some sort of thing related to their religion? Yeah, so uh, even... Uh, my theology is more of an embodied and outward theology. I think what is religious is the way I understand my relationship with what is outside of me and how I interact with the world, the, the social world for sure, but also a world that I believe God inhabits. I don't think religiousness is anything about something inside of me. Okay. So I'm not looking, and I think people kind of misunderstand as a religious experience inside of them the experience of understanding uh, a, a aspect of the world as, as deeply significant. Mm -hmm. So the birth of a child is deeply significant. And then people understand that religiously and almost talk about it as an inward religious experience, which is really a, a, a way of understanding and interacting with the world itself and so and that's why the whole research on religiousness gets captured by basically subjective emotional um, inner experiences because that's the way people uh, kind of tend to talk about their I think we live in an individualist society so we and our religiousness is very individual and so we we kind of try to capture this as something inside of me which i don't think it is i think it's about me as a whole person the way i interact with the world that is around me mm -hmm. so let's see where was that sorry did i did i answer the question i got off i'm not sure i answered your question uh, uh, yeah because, because uh, uh what i was asking you is if you think that perhaps many times people that are uh, studying uh, religious yes. phenomena and religious thinking and things like that if perhaps in certain ways the kinds of behaviors and thoughts that they are studying are, in, are a bit removed from the common experience of common people. I mean, beca because I was yeah. just thinking, for example, about rituals and r yeah. in certain societies and some of yeah. them are really extreme. And I mean, if you compare that... Yeah to the experiences that people that go to a mass, for example, yeah. a Catholic mass, I mean, it, 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 it's not concert. at all the same thing. Or a rock concert. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I just think that there, that uh, there's nothing within me that is uh, set off and particularly religious, that religiousness is something about me as a functioning whole person in relationship to the world that is outside of me. Then that includes maybe some rituals that actually I participate in an interactive and create certain feelings and experiences in me, but that is not the religiousness. The religiousness is something about my interaction with the world as a whole. So I think it's just uh, not the right way to think about religiousness, to think about it reductively by thinking about it as something, as some part of me, as opposed to something about me as a complete person and the way I interact with the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we talk about religious experiences, we tend to say that they are meaningful experiences yeah. in some way. So what is meaning in this case and what is meaning from a neuroscientific perspective? Well, 
there are systems in the brain that get activated in situations as uh, more activated as the situations get sort of more intense and therefore more meaningful in the sense of how I'm interacting with the environment. Uh, the amygdala would be one, the, uh, the um, uh, mesolimbic and mesocortical dopamine systems get a lot going on and the more significant it is, the more dopamine you get dumped into these systems. Uh, and so there are things that are going on that are uh, a part of the uh, noting of the significance of situations in the environment that you know, I experience uh, in some way as, uh, and I think that's a whole body experience of kind of feedback like Damasio talks about, about, wow, this is really important. I get bodily feedback about the way this whole system is and that kind of influences the way I think about them or the way I code them. But I, yeah, so, but I, I think in the, uh, to talk about a God spot, for example, is to reduce all of this to some little area. And I don't think there's any unique little areas. I think it's about us as whole beings. Mm -hmm. So it also has a social component to it. I mean, perhaps when thinking about religion, we not always, not only have to think about what happens in the brain and in our bodies, but also the way we interact with other people. Yeah, I think uh, religiousness is highly social. I mean, that's the way we learn it. Uh, that's the way we practice it. Uh, and so a lot of the significance is overlapping or very similar to social significance times. Other things that we mean do, like a rock concert that is with a whole lot of people and, you know, dancing or whatever together, and therefore you get this, you know, exhilarated experience as a social uh, experience. Yeah. So uh, another thing that we can talk about when we think about the brain and how it operates is how different parts of it and also how different cognitive mechanisms might have evolved. In the case of religion, I mean, I've already had several cognitive scientists of religion on the show and there are several different hypotheses. There's the, adapt there's the adaptionistic hypothesis, there's the, the byproduct hypothesis and things like that. I mean, do, do you have any take on this kind of a discussion about how religion might have evolved? Uh, no, not particularly. I mean, I understand those and I understand um, they do presume that uh, there is a genetic, a particular genetic evolutionary uh, influence or an influence of religiousness that develops religiousness and therefore it's somehow genetic, which I don't think it is. I think there are certainly social things are. I think um, religiousness is something more uh, social, communal, and theological than it is my personal physical genetics. Um, so, for example, one kind of social theory of religiousness that never gets mentioned much in these conversations, and I don't know why, <clears throat> is Rene Girard's uh, theory of scapegoat theory, that we became religious because we couldn't get along with each other. And so in our inability to get along with each other, we had to find a scapegoat it's to dump our, dis, you know, our, our bad feelings on some scapegoat so that we could get along with each other. And, uh, he, and Rene Girard has this whole theory about the way that evolves into religiousness that has scapegoats and whatever. Uh, so that's just another, it's not a genetic theory, that's not a cognitive theory, but it is a social construct theory that uh, never quite gets mentioned in all of that. It's a, a social evolutionary theory is what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and what about the debate between science and religion? I mean, do you think that what we learn from science in any way uh, negates the kinds of uh, beliefs that people have about religion? Or do you think that perhaps the things that science and religion deal with uh, 
uh, are different and they are simply interested in different things. Yeah, no, I wouldn't concept uh, push them apart like that. My friend Donald Mackay called that conceptual apartheid. And I don't believe in conceptual apartheid. I believe these things have to be thought about together. Uh, I wrote a paper uh, way back on what I call resonance theory. And that's a metaphor about how you think about how these relate to each other. So the, the metaphor is you're standing in the middle of a bunch of like radios and they all are, are uh, projecting an auditory signal. And I'm sitting in the middle trying to hear, listen for resonance mm -hmm. between all these sources. And one source may be science, and then another may be philosophy, another may be my common experience, another may be my religious background. And so I have all of these things. In each one of those domains, there's a range of reasonable interpretation. There's things outside, but there's a range. And I think the task is to go to each one of those sources of information and tweak them so their their radios so that they you can tune them to tune them so that there's greater resonance with other areas so when science seems to not be resonant with something in common experience my question is are we misinterpreting common experience do we need to tweak that or are we misinterpreting our science and the hypotheses that have come out of these or theories that have come out of these studies are actually not quite right. We need to tweak them. You can't, you don't tweak them outside of the empirical data that supports the theory, but there is some range of theoretical interpretation of that data. So you want to look for the best theory. So I think we're constantly in a, a domain in which we're trying to find the greatest resonance between all of these sources of human, of information and particularly information about human nature about the nature of us as persons. And so I think we, I think that's our task. And so when I find these conflicts, I think somewhere we got a misinterpret, a misinterpretation somewhere. So maybe if somebody has a, a, a biblical interpretation of human nature, and I said, you know, that, that just doesn't make any sense. Let's go back and look at the biblical te text, for example, and see if it really says that, or see if in the context of the whole passage of the whole scripture that that really is being misunderstood or maybe we look at science and maybe we say you know that can't be true that's not consistent with my personal experience and it's not something that we would uh, uh, endorse on other basis on a philosophical basis maybe so maybe we need to kind of tweak that so some of the uh, grossest reductive in theoretical interpretations in science, I would just disagree with that. You you have you you don't need to interpret it that way. Your science is your observations are great, they're valid and whatever, but there's another way you can take an emergentive understanding of that and and explain that data. You don't have to explain it as a reductive and an emergentive point of view has much more traction and resonance with these other things that we know about human beings from other points of view. Mm -hmm. So you have sort of an integrative approach between these several different uh, areas and perhaps epistemological ways of thinking about things, but don't you think that there are at least certain questions that perhaps religion deals with, like, for example, morality, values, and even the existence of God, for example, that fall outside of sure. the uh, outside yeah. of science. I mean, that yeah. science doesn't yeah. deal with. Exactly. It. And I think science talks about some things that that uh, religious and philosophical understandings just don't deal with. I mean, that's just outside of their domain. So in my paper, I talked about, you know, in some questions, there are certain sources that I got to dominate because that's their domain of question, but they can't, can't be, it's not, um, it's the uh, uh, process hasn't finished if the outcome of the science is now not resonant with other things. We got more to do than just default to the scientific interpretation. If it's at odd with other things, we just got to do more work. We got to think about the science. We got to think about our other 
areas, our understanding of morality. Uh, and then I think the last thing is that uh, the uh, nature and existence of God is a theological question that is, and it's not just formal theology, it's personal theology as well, that would be a domain in which science doesn't have any input on, because it is a question, the, the existence of a non-material possibility in the world is just not a scientific question. But that existence, and the way I understand that existence, shouldn't be uh, uh, dissonant with what comes out of science. If so, I got to rethink my understanding of religiousness, or, or I got to rethink, somebody's got to rethink what's happening in science. So again, I come back to this idea, I think we just have work to do when they seem to but I agree, there are questions of which science has the primary uh, methodological way of answering that question, and then other questions that theology is predominant because science doesn't have a methodology to deal with that. Mm -hmm. So the fact that, for example, certain scientists completely dismiss religion because they say that uh, I mean, we can't prove many of the beliefs that people have, uh, prove in an empirical way, let's say, many of the beliefs that people have. Uh, I, I mean, do, do you think that's relevant to the discussion here, that we can't prove it empirically or not? Well, I mean, I, I basically disagree with the statement. Okay. Uh, I think what is, is being missed is... Um, that you can perhaps explain on a, let's say, a social history learning and learning neuroscience way, the, the, the reason a person believes something in a particular way. Fine. That doesn't answer the question as to whether or not God exists, for example. That, you, that doesn't explain a way a question, uh, but it does say that this person's belief about that does have some historical, learning, social, um, cultural, um, uh, ex at least partial explanation. It's explanation of that person's belief. It's not an explanation of whether something else exists or not. Mm -hmm. But uh, are there any good ways for us to develop this sort of religious knowledge in a rigorous... I mean, I, I was about to use the word rigorous, but I'm not sure if something that is not uh, empirically proven is not... Uh, is is not rational or uh, I mean it, it falls outside of what we would call proper or proper or rigorous knowledge I mean uh, how should we deal with those kinds of questions uh, I think it's a, we deal with them as persons empirically so my my question is can I learn does this uh, religious structure that I live within does it allow me to live better, to have better social relationships, uh, have a way of comprehending things that are seem incomprehensible? Uh, so I think that's the only way that, and that's not irrational. That's actually, actually for me, quite rational. Uh, it's not scientifically empirical, but it is personally empirical. So I think the question for all of this is how can I live best and does my religious life and my religious group help me to live better in the world? And I think the, the nature of that world for me is a world that God inhabits and therefore as I come closer to what is true about life and my understanding of it, it will, it will mesh better with my life in the world, it will construct my life better. So I, I, I that's not a, a good uh, 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 theoretical uh, philosophy 
point of view, analytic philosophy point of view. That's not a very good scientific point of view, but I think that for common experience and human life, I think that's the way uh, we, it's not irrational. It does play into my life in the world in a way that either makes it better or doesn't make it better. Then of course, what are the explanations of better and how to, where do I get those? And yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Brown, let's end the interview here. Just before we go, are there any good places on the internet where people can find your work? Um, no, <laughs> I mean, a lot. I don't have a podcast. I don't have, uh, uh, I mean, there are uh, my website and the Travis Research Institute has a lot of my um empirical work in neuropsychology there's also a link there to my cv and you can see the books i've written you could probably google my name and come up with some of the books that i worked on that that deal with this material but i don't have i'm not like you ricardo i don't have a good <laughs> podcast going that uh has easy access to this work Okay, so I will be leaving links to your work in the description box of the interview, Dr. Brown. And thank you again for taking the time to come on the show. And it was really fun to talk to you. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. It has been fun. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. I have started this channel back in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. And I would really like to keep doing this in the long run. And so please visit my Patreon page and consider making a pledge there or go to my PayPal links in the description box and you can also make a monthly pledge there or a one-time big donation or several times big donations. It's as you prefer. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, and hit the subscription button. Finally, I would like to give a huge thank you to my patrons and supporters, the main ones, Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anion Kata, Jacob Klinkwi, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf. Tim Hollacy, Eric Alenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Kintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassio, Arthur Coe, Zoop, Marco Neves, Max Bailby, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, George Pinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Robert Roberto Inguanzo, Mikel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Felicia Stevens, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, João Alves da Silva, Jonathan Leibrandt, Oslan Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, uh, Staten T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, Sardus Franz, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Deza Araujo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, and Dmitry Grigoriev. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Sergio Quadriano, Luis Caetano, Matthew Lavender, Tom Van Egdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, and my executive producers Michel Rujewski, Rosie, and James Pratt. Thank you for all.